my channel um if that's what Just we a have few seconds. I think it's now live on your channel. Okay, great. Am I right? Yes. Okay, great, great. Okay, we have that. And I'm going to start the live stream for our Persian I'll just be right back in seven seconds. Okay, no problem. No problem. And I'm back. Thank you. Professor Anthony, how are you doing? All right. How are you doing? Good to see you. Great. Thank you. Okay, very good. I think we can start now. We have about 90 people here with that, with that at, at Zoom and uh, people are joining in the apparat and the YouTube channel. So everything is set. Uh, I just started recording and after that, Professor Anthony, uh, Dr. Javad, you can start uh, everything introducing Professor Anthony and... Okay, so I'm going to start now. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, today's session is called Revising Modern Historical Approaches to the Life and Times of the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, it is being led by Professor Sean Anthony. So I'm going to do an introduction to our guest lecturer. Um, so Sean Anthony is Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at The Ohio State University. His scholarship focuses on early Islamic history and the emergence of the literary traditions and canons of Arabic literature. He earned a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago with a focus on Islamic thought and early Islamic history. Professor Anthony is currently editor-in-chief of the Journal of the International Quranic Studies Association. Uh, he's known for his several publications, most notably perhaps is his Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, which I have right here before me. So if you haven't read that book, please do purchase it. It's now, I think, mandatory reading in Islamic studies, um, as well as the translation of uh, this early biography of the Prophet Muhammad as well. Um, and of course, many other publications. Uh, he also engages in what can be called public scholarship. Uh, so he's available on uh, Twitter, or at least the website formerly known as Twitter, now called X. And his Twitter handle is S-H-A-H-A-N-S-E-A-N. -A -A um, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Anthony on. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction, Javad. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Uh, and then we'll jump in. Um, let me see. And I think uh, if you could make sure that no one else can annotate, mm -hmm. that would be good. All right, that should be visible. Anthony, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah, please. please, 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 please. Uh, if you could please speak a little bit slower, that would be much easier for our translator to translate mm -hmm. what you say in Persian. So I'm so sorry, but that would be really appreciated. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, if I'm not doing well, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, it's not a problem. Okay, so what I would like to do is essentially give an overview of, well, the ideas that were behind the writing of the book, why I wrote the book, what the motivations were, not necessarily its main thesis, uh, but many of the ideas and authors that it was responding to. 
in why I thought it, it should be written. Um, it's not meant to be a definitive biography of the Prophet Muhammad by any means. Uh, I would hope that it would be sort of a prolegumena or an introduction or kind of laying the groundwork for thinking about where we can move forward. I felt in general that scholarship on the historical Muhammad had been laid aside in general by many people in the Western Academy. And it was something that was no longer of primary interest. And I felt that this was an unfortunate. Um, and one of the reasons why I felt it was unfortunate is because I felt there were kind of many discoveries, many new texts that had appeared uh, that needed to be brought into conversation with one another. And that also um, there were a lot of old and outdated misconceptions that began to dominate um, a lot of the secondary literature and especially a lot of introductory surveys uh, that I felt did not reflect the spe uh, specialist knowledge within the field. Um, so in general, that's the main inspiration. I think it will become a bit clearer as we kind of go forward. Whenever you're dealing with Anglophone scholarship, and I'm mostly I'm going to be talking about Anglophone scholarship, uh, Germanophone scholarship differs a bit. Um, so I apologize for being limited and being parochial here and talking about Anglophone scholarship. But Anglophone scholarship in particular tended to be dominated by uh, a scholar, a Scottish Orientalist who is probably known to many, many people named Montgomery Watt. And he wrote a very kind of magisterial, imposing biography of Muhammad in two volumes, uh, the first volume, which appeared in 1953. Um, and he wrote his volume at a time that uh, he thought was ripe for a new biography of Muhammad. Um, and it was successful, coherent, and imposing enough that it, in many ways it sort of killed. Um, future uh, scholarship. Um, I, not a lot of people followed him up. I'm oftentimes I'm very surprised when I look at the initial publication date of Montgomery Watts' first volume that it was in 1953. And I remember reading my first biography of the Prophet Muhammad was probably the epitome, the kind of um, the abbreviated, abridged version of Montgomery Watts. Uh, two volumes, a volume called Muhammad, uh, Prophet and Statesman, I think is the title. And that's the one that was um, recommended to me. And by that time, it was already many decades old. Um, so it was something that was produced in the 1950s, I would suspect, uh, would not be sufficient for someone that began reading about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. I was in college in the mid-90s. But that's really what the field stuck to. And it was an approach that I think, um, sorry, my slide is up. It was an approach that I think uh, was a product of its era. To quote Montgomery Watt here, he kind, of, he kind of gives this nice introduction. It's a very famous one where he kind of wa wants to walk a line, civilizational dialogue on the one hand. Uh, he was a very sincerely believing Christian. And so he was interested in religious dialogue on the other. And so he wanted to produce a monograph that was far superior to something like we did with William Moore, which was uh, written by a missionary and full of polemics and things like that. Um, but what he what he writes, particularly to his Muslim readers in the beginning, he says, to my Muslim readers, I would say uh, that I have endeavored while remaining faithful to the standards of Western historical scholarship to say nothing that would entail the rejection of any fundamental doctrines of Islam. There need be no unbridgeable gulf between Western scholarship and Islamic faith. If some of the conclusions of Western scholarship have been unacceptable to, Mus uh, to Muslims, I should say to Muslims, it may be that the scholars have not always been faithful to their own principles of scholarship, so on and so on and so forth. And then he also suggests that perhaps um, Muslims have something to learn or reform as well. So he sees that scholarship is in dialogue with, with Muslims and very much framed by the perceptions that uh, believing Muslims will have. Um, I will say for myself, it, <laughs> I to put a, a blunt, I, this, these are not issues that I care about.
Uh, I do not care about um, interfaith understanding as a scholar. I do not care about intercivilizational understanding as a scholar or anything like that. I mostly am concerned with uh, disciplinary knowledge um, and producing disciplinary knowledge. We could talk more about that later, but I have a very different um, kind of approach than, than Watt, even on my kind of philosophy of why, why we should write history, or in particular the history of the life of uh, the Prophet Muhammad. In any case, to give you an idea of the state of scholarship a few decades later, I like to quote this uh, passage from Robinson, which I felt really captures the malaise that fell over the field in terms of uh, the lack of interest in doing any more real research in, in the Prophet Muhammad. So Robinson, when he opens up his book, uh, which is also a very famous biography, the Prophet Muhammad, written by a Western scholar. Uh, he writes in 1968, so about 10 years before I was born. And he says, uh, my book does not propose to bring out new facts about the subject. So nothing new had happened, I guess, since the 1950s in the field. Uh, even all, already 20 years later, basically, almost. None had been discovered for a long time. And it is unlikely that any will be. There is nothing to discover, none, nothing to uncover. Our source material has not grown appreciably, and critical analysis has not advanced since the two remarkable works of Montgomery Watt. I find that to be very depressing. Um, in any case, I think in the wake of uh, this sort of um, sleepiness, kind of the sleepy headed attitude of Western scholarship on early Islam, historical Muhammad in general, uh, what we really have that emerges subsequently to infuse new life into uh, early Islamic scholarship is the, is the rise of the revisionists. It didn't have a very skeptical attitude towards what is knowable in general. And their answer tended to be extremely pessimistic. And I think this is mostly exemplified in the early work of Patricia Cronet, one of my mentors. Um, and she writes in this really famous uh, introduction to her book, Slaves on Horses, that has a lot of polemic in it, it has a lot of energy. It, is, it just really is a product of the era, and it's exciting to read, I think, even now. And she kind of expresses the problem in a way I think only she could. Uh, she says, that thanks to its success, and what she's referring to is what uh, is the earliest biography of the Prophet Muhammad known to survive at that time. And that's the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, who died in the middle of the eighth century under uh, the Abbasids. He was the first scholar to be buried in Baghdad, actually. Uh, it says, similar to, uh, similarly, thanks to its success, the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq is practically our only source for the life of Muhammad preserved within the Islamic tradition. It says the work is late, written not by a grandchild, but a great grandchild of the prophet's generation. It gives us the view for which classical Islam had settled. And written by the member of the ulama, the scholars who had by then emerged as the classical bearers of the Islamic tradition, the picture which it offers is also one-sided. How the Umayyad Kilas remembered their prophet, we shall never know. That it is unhistorical is only what one would expect, but it has an extraordinary capacity to resist internal criticism, a feature unparalleled in either the Skandaka, this is the earliest record of the life of uh, Siddhartha, the, the Buddha, or the Gospels, but characteristic of the entire Islamic tradition, the most pronounced in the Quran, one can take the picture, present it, or one can leave it, but one cannot work with it. So what... I wanted to do is to kind of overturn this pessimism that Cronin uh, kind of uh, expressed in almost every <laughs> way. Number one, I wanted to argue that Ibn Ishaq is not our only window into the life of the Prophet Muhammad. I wanted to argue that uh, we knew, we know, and can know quite a bit about what the Umayyads thought about Prophet Muhammad. Uh, 
and how they understood his life, at least those scholars that were close to the Umayyad caliphs. Uh, I also wanted to show that uh, we can work with the Syria literature. We can use it as a historical source. And I also wanted to show that the Syria literature, or I like to call it the Mahazi literature, I'll use both. Uh, the Mahazi and the Syria literature are not practically our only source for the life of Muhammad. And that we have good reason to be uh, optimistic that we have much to learn about the Prophet Muhammad beyond what we find in the Syria literature. And oftentimes in contradiction to it, but beyond what we find in the Syria literature, but also working with it. Now, one of the things that helped me in particular to get over this pessimism, I must say, is that Krona changed her mind in large part towards the end of her life, uh, as any good scholar will do. We never know what our opinions will be at the end of our life and when we start out. Uh, but she changed her mind, especially in terms of the sort of pessimism that's, that she expresses in this famous introduction. Um, in a 2008 article uh, written for a popular audience, called What Do We Actually Know About the Prophet Muhammad? She expresses this optimism. She says, in the case of Muhammad, Muslim literary sources for his life only begin around 750 to 800. I would put this back a little bit. Some four to five generations after his death, a few Islamists these days assume them to be straightforward historical accounts. For all that, we probably know more about Muhammad than we do about Jesus, let alone about Moses or the Buddha. And we certainly have the potential to know a great deal more. So where does this potential to know a great deal more come from? So in the book in general, I try to set what I think are the main sources and give an idea of how we might know more and what are some of the surprises that we find, some of the interesting things we find. Um, one of the things that I focus on in particular is just how early our evidence is for just the sheer existence of a figure named Muhammad. Uh, we have basically documents that survive within a decade of the traditional date for the death of the Prophet Muhammad. One of my favorite and one of the most extraordinary, I think, is this opening fly sheet of, um, of the Syriac manuscript of, of a gospel text. Um, Right after this opening fly sheet, uh, you have the fly sheet, by the way, is the blank piece of paper that a book is bound with. Um, right after this fly sheet, you have the Gospel of Mark, if memory serves. Uh, it doesn't survive in good condition. It's usually one of the first pages of a book to suffer, but it has this amazing qualifier. The gospel text that's uh, in this entire manuscript is much older than the note. Uh, but we have this note where someone, we don't really know who, and we can barely read what they wrote, uh, wrote down a series of notes about uh, recent historical events. And we find Muhammad's name is mentioned twice in the document, spelled in Syriac letters. Uh, if you're looking for the Arabic uh, or Persian, it would be Mim Wal Ha Mim Dal, is how it's spelled. Um, and it tells of the recent incursions of Arabs into Palestine. And it even mentions um, a defeat of the Romans. It mentions the Battle of Yarmouk. Here it's called Gabitha. And it mentions the defeat of the, of the Roman army as well. Um, and it doesn't really say much about who Muhammad is and things like this. Uh, but we do have his name. It doesn't say that he's dead either. Some have read this and said that this is evidence for Muhammad still being alive. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but in any case, we have a very early mention of the, of the name of the Prophet Muhammad. And there are many other sources like this. We could, we could basically have a lecture going through all of the seventh century sources that mention Muhammad directly in some way, be they non-Muslim or Muslim sources. I'll just give one more example. Uh, one of the more interesting examples that I dedicate a chapter uh, talking about uh, the topic um, is written by Jacob of Edessa, uh, one of the most important scholars of the Syriac tradition, uh, writ large. He lived most of his life uh, in the early Islamic period, 
He wrote many letters in which he discusses an array of issues related to Christianity and the and the administration of the Christian church, etc. And oftentimes he makes comments on uh, contemporary affairs related to uh, the early Muslims as well. He also has a very short chronicle that survives. It has kind of entries per year. And one of the most curious entries is, uh, this is before the rise of Islam, he has an entry about Muhammad and his trading. He says that in such and such year, Muhammad goes down on business to trade the land of Palestine, the land of the Arabians, the Phoenicians, and the Tyrians. And then he mentions there's an eclipse, and the Persians took captives and destroyed the entire land of the Romans as far as Bithynia, Asia, and the Sea of the Pontus. And it's talking here about the onset of the last Byzantine Persian War. Um, one thing that's extraordinary about it is that, number one, it portrays the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad as a traitor. A minor theme in the Mahazi literature, uh, but a major theme in early Christian literature. And in general, it's a minor theme in the Mahazi literature because usually Muhammad's trade journeys are mentioned as only being two at maximum. One when he's very young, traveling with his uncle Abu Talib, and the other one when he's an older gentleman. Uh, recently married to, or before he's married to Khadija, uh, traveling up to Bostra, which would still be in Arabia, the Roman province of Arabia. Here, Jacob of Edessa affirms, way before the Sira has ever been written or compiled, that Muhammad was a traitor, that he was known as a traitor, um, and that he did trade in Roman Arabia. But he also kind of adds a broader ambit to his trading and his traveling. It mentions Palestine, he mentions Phoenicia, this would be modern day Lebanon. Uh, he mentions Tyre, also modern day Lebanon, which is a pretty extensive circuit. Um, and definitely no, nothing similar survives in the early Islamic tradition in terms of the, uh, the travels of, of the Prophet Muhammad. But again, what we have here is a kind of the evidence of an early kind of uh, historiography and information about who the prophet Muhammad was as well. Uh, there's a lot of other sources like this, probably the most important early one, I think, at least in, in my estimation, is that of a figure we call Pseudo Sabios, early Armenian historian, which we do not have time to talk about. Um, okay, what else has changed besides the non-Muslim sources? The other thing that was a big deal is the discovery of the Sena palimpsest. Uh, the discovery of the Sena palimpsest, if you don't know what a palimpsest is, it's uh, it's very simply a, well, well, I'll put it this way. Most precious early works were written on papyrus, so animal skin. And because papyrus was expensive, uh, it was often reused. And so a text would be erased. And then after that text was erased, you write a new text on top. Uh, that's the palimpsest. The Salam, the Salam palimpsest is extraordinary because it has a very early, it's a very early copy of the Quran, the upper text. But even beneath it is an even older copy of the Quran uh, that can be viewed barely, uh, mostly thanks to uh, the fact that the erased ink still survives, particularly its iron, uh, the iron part of it, it oxidizes, makes it visible. Um, and then with the help of UV light, it's a bit more legible. Not perfectly so, but a bit more legible. So what the Sana Palimpsest gave us was not just one early example of the Quran, proving that the Quran was a very early text, but also an even earlier stratum of the Quranic text below. So it was, it was an extraordinary find uh, all by itself, but it was accompanied by, uh, well, it took, several decades for um, traction to get going on this, but it was accompanied by a revival in the, in the interest in the materiality of the Quranic text. What do I mean by that? This, uh, it's a revival in the interest in, in studying the, mater the earliest material remains of the text, the earliest material witnesses to the Arabic script and how it evolved, and the revival interest in the uh, earliest material, and this is through the transmission of the Quran. And 
personally, I think this was devastating to a, a, a once popular strand of scholarship that wanted to view the Quran as being codified and being made into the form that we have it today, only under the early Abbasids. So let's say late ninth century. And that um, thesis I think is in the rubbish heap right now. Um, how early the actual the Quran was actually codified is still being debated. I think it was codified around 650. Um, in any case, this revival and interest in the Quran, I think, inspired a renewed effort to look at the Quran as a historical source, as a literary document too, but also as a source for history. Quran is not an easy historical source by any means, uh, but it does tell us quite a bit. I think, well, about early Islam, early Muslims, uh, and Muhammad himself. Especially, I would say, the materiality of the Quran and its early reception teaches us a great deal about the influence of the Quran, about the influence of its idiom, and, um, and also kind of its impact in the world of late antiquity writ large. I want to say a few words about what we learn about Muhammad from the Quran. So one of the key things to note is that Muhammad is named in the Quran. As, uh, as recently been said, I've seen it, seen it said multiple times that the Quran is an anonymous corpus. It's not entirely anonymous. I think that's incorrect. Um, for one, Muhammad does rarely appear as a name in the Quran. It only appears in four passages. But that's only because the name, as in the, the personal name of the person that the Quran is addressed to in general, is usually referred to by an epithet, by an appellation, right? So though the name Muhammad appears only four times, words like Rasul or the messenger or Anabi appear all over the place. Uh, so in general, we have this idea, if we look at the Quran, it's addressed to, I think, a person, right? It's addressed to a person in particular named Muhammad. If we, I'm just going to say a couple of words about the designations of Muhammad and how the, and how the Quran kind of addresses itself to its recipient to sort of underscore this idea of the Quran as a historical source. I hope it's not difficult to translate uh, because it is kind of dense. Uh, but I just want to go through some of the designations uh, really briefly. So number one, I would like to say that most suras are composed in a divine voice. Right? So it's a divine voice that is speaking. And the key thing to keep in mind is that divine voice is directed to an implied pri privileged addressee. Right? So I'll say it again, an implied privileged addressee. So there's someone that is talking to that it privileges amongst all the other figures that it talks to generally as an audience. And usually we know that it is speaking to this implied pri privileged addressee because it uses a singular masculine form of address, right? So it uses a, the second person masculine pronoun. Enta, ka, if it's a suffix, right? Or it uses a verbal imperative. Thus, for example, the command to say uh, uh, to this addressee appears at least 341 times in the corpus. The command give tidings, bashif, 17 times. Uh, the command to warn, andir, about six times, right? And some, and, it, and one thing that is key and does make this a little bit difficult is that some, passage do, some passages do employ the second person singular masculine form of address to uh, direct people in general rather than the Prophet Muhammad exclusively. And so there are many ambiguous cases. And I'll give you a famous one. So if we consider Surah Al-Duha in the sixth verse of Al-Duha, um, the divine voice asks, did we not find you an orphan, yatiman, right? And provide your shelter for Allah. And so this has often been read in the exegetical tradition and by historians as a Quranic reference to the prophet Muhammad being an orphan when he was a youth, right? So that's what the tafsir tells us. 
That's what the Mah the Mahazi and the Sira literature tells us. Right. Um, but is that what the Quran tells us? Right. So the answer is we're not sure. And I'll tell you why we're not sure. So while many readers do infer that the orphan mentioned here must be Muhammad, uh, the passage actually employs a orphan metaphor that is very well attested in pre-Islamic inscriptions. In particular, it's attested in the prayers of supplicants to gods in pre-Islamic Safaitic inscriptions. That is a very common for the person who is praying right, to characterize themselves as the yatim, as the orphan in need, in need of the divine, the divinity's help. And if you're interested in, in finding these sorts of materials, uh, I strongly recommend the uh, the work of my colleague uh, Ahmed Al Jalal, who works in particularly with these Safavid inscriptions. So sometimes it's un uncertain. Uh, in any case, a lot of times it's not so uncertain. So the Quran calls its privileged addressee by many various des different designations, right? So it addresses um, his uh, the addressee as the cloaked man, Al Muzammil. It addresses him as Al Mudathir, right? This is very famous. What these mean, we're not certain. Um, but many of the designations have a very straightforward sense. The privileged addressee of the Quran is often called the servant or the slave of God, his abd. Um, he's often called his rasul, his messenger. Uh, he's often called also his nedi. Right? When we go through uh, what this person is and what he's all about, the Quran tells us a lot of very interesting things too uh, about not only him, but also his naysayers, his opponents. His opponents, for example, object to his claim that he receives revelation, and they object to his claim uh, that he is an angel. Sorry, that he is a that he is a messenger. Sorry. And what do they object? They object uh, to the idea that God sends men as messengers. He says only angels are messengers, right? They don't, God does not send messengers who eat and walk about markets. But the messenger replies that he is but a mere mortal. He's a bashar. He's like the men, Rijal, whom God sent as prior messengers, and who, like him, had wives and children. He's also said to be a messenger whom God sent to the unscriptured, fil umiyin, and also from them. He sent to a people, a kaum, whose forefathers were never before warned, that is, by a prophet, nor were they given a divine message. Uh, the Quran portrays him as never, never having recited nor written down any scripture before the Quran, and he's thus called the unscriptured messenger prophet, al-Rasul al-Nabi al umi whom Jews and Christians ought to find described in the Torah and the Gospel. He is also a messenger who's been sent to and from the progeny of Uriah of Abraham and his son Ishmael, who themselves, that is Abraham and Ishmael, founded the sanctuary, the bait of their Lord, where this prophet, that is Muhammad's people, are said to reside, a people whom the messenger commands to follow the faith, the Milla of Abraham his people's forefather. God sent them a messenger to recite to them his signs, um, to purify them, to teach them scripture and wisdom, and to grant them knowledge. He is neither the first nor the only messenger in the Quran's conception. Rather, Muhammad is only a messenger prior to whom uh, messengers have gone before. Believers owe him their obedience, for to obey God is to obey the messenger. Yeah. And he also receives neither tribute, kharj, nor wage, ajr, from his people. Right? His primary command is rather to serve God alone, to associate none other with him, and to call others to obey and worship him. We can go on and on. There's a lot of examples of this type of stuff and the other sorts of interactions the Quran has. In general, the Quran gives us a very rich understanding of what the content of um, the, the Quranic messenger's preaching was. 
We know what his message was. We know to whom it would, he was sent. And we know a great deal about how they reacted to it. I think we also can reconstruct a large number of the historical events that occur um, during his lifetime from the Quran itself as, as well. Uh, this would require a lot more time and detail than, than we have the ability to go into uh, right now. But in any case, I like this particular passage in general. Uh, this is from sort of the uh, al uh, where it's very explicitly about who this messenger of God is. Right? Uh, it says, if we start off uh, at verse 20, um, 29, rather, um, it says very clearly, Muhammad is the messenger of God. That's, that's who this guy is, right? Um, and it has a very interesting statement about both uh, he and his followers and their relationship to their opponents. Those who follow him are harsh towards the disbelievers and compassionate towards each other. You see them kneeling, that is the believers, kneeling and prostrating, seeking God's bounty and his good pleasure. On their faces, they bear the marks of their prostrations. This is how they are pictured in the Torah and the gospel, like a seed that puts forth its shoot, becomes strong, grows thick, and rises on its stem through the light of its sowers. So God infuriates the disbelievers through them. God promises forgiveness and a great reward to those who believe and do righteous deeds, right? And here we have a nice early example of this text that I just read to you uh, in manuscript. It's, it's held at the Oriental, Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, where I studied. And we have here the Prophet Muhammad's name written very clearly in, in Arabic. Um, and also like this particular passage as well, because it points to kind of the way that uh, the Quran aligns itself with the with the previous monotheistic communities of the Christians and Jews with the citation, well, at least an allusion to the famous uh, parable of Jesus that one fall, found, finds in Mark chapter four. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. So also, if we think about the Quran as a text that um, has a reception history, and it's producing a religion whose idiom and whose practices has a reception history. I think one of the most important things that have, that have occurred in general has been the revival and in interest in the material uh, uh, record of the, the Quran's reception history and the material record of early Muslim religiosity. One of my favorite examples is this inscription of, uh, of Ar-Riyan ibn Abdullah. Right. Um, I'll just read it in Arabic and then we'll I'll go over the translation because it's really nice. It says, Shahida Arayan ibn Abdullahi, Anahu la ilaha illallah, wa Shahida an Muhammadan Rasulullah. Right. So Arayan ibn Abdullah testifies that there is no God but God. He testifies that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And then it suffices whosoever comes here to testify. To that. Uh, may God show mercy to Al Rayan, and forgive him, and show him the way or give him guidance to the way of paradise. Is it no? And I ask him to be martyred in his path. Amen. And then he says with this amazing last line, thank you, Ar Arrayan, for writing this line. It's helped historians out immensely. Um, I wrote this writing, Kitabtu had al Kitab Amma, the year that Bunia al Masjid al Haram, the year that the sacred mosque was rebuilt. This refers to Abd al Malik's reconstruction of the sacred mosque after it was burnt down by Al-Hajjaj while suppressing the revolt of Ibn al-Zubayr. And when did he write this? In the year 78, Hijri, so 697-698 AD. You know, we have a lot of these inscriptions. Uh, and we're going to have a lot more, and we're looking forward to seeing a lot of the ones that have been only published on Twitter so far to be uh, officially documented and published in academic uh, publications so that we can cite them properly and give them give the, those who discovered them the proper credit. This in particular one has been published. It was first published by Nelson and Hanafi in, in 2007. Um, okay, 
moving on to the Mahazi works. So the other thing that the, that the book wants to do is to reevaluate the Mahazi works. So one of the things that we can recall is the early view of Corona expressed in um, Slaves on Horses that really only had one uh, book. Muhammad, this one right here in the third generation, Muhammad ibn Ishaq died 767 in Baghdad. Um, a lot of the book is trying to argue that we have a lot more than that. We might have writings by Urwa ibn al-Zubair, who is the son of uh, the companion, al-Zubair ibn Awam, and also the nephew of Aisha, one of the prophet's wives. I think we definitely have the writings, although dispersed, of Ibn Shahab Zuhri, who died in 742. Uh, both these guys uh, are Medinans. And Ibn Shahab in, in particular had not only intimate relations with uh, all the Quraysh of, uh, of Medina, but also with the Umayyad court as well. Urwa has good relationship with the Umayyad court, uh, Umayyad caliphs at least, after his brother's uh, revolt is suppressed. Um, his story is very interesting. It, I, Tell it in the book, or you can read it if you want. And then we have this third generation of figures. Uh, Musa ibn Uqba, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, Ma'amar ibn Rashid, Muhammad ibn Umar al waqidi um, And we've known that we've had Waqidi in part and Muhammad ibn Ishaq in part. Um, but we also have, in recent years now, have Ma'amar ibn Rashid. It's preserved by Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani. In his Musannaf. We also have an uh, independent manuscript of his Jannah that survives as well. It's unedited, um, but it uh, it's survives also in the Musannaf of, of Abd al Razak. And then we also have the recent discovery and publication only this year of uh, the Medinan section, at least most of the Medinan section of Musa ibn Uqbas uh, uh, Bahazi. So I think what's paramount and one of the things that uh, a lot of my book tries to do is to want to understand what this genre is. What's it, what is it doing? How does it work? How does it evolve? Um, and um, who wrote it and under, under what conditions? I still think that we're still in the very early stage of understanding the genre and, and everything that it's trying to sort of achieve. If we look at its earliest layer, uh, I think the earliest layer is probably represented by uh, the letters of Umar ibn al-Zubayr. Um, we see that we have already a pretty broad outline that we'll find expanded upon and improved upon by subsequent authors. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is out of the eight topics that are covered, uh, they mostly we see a strong bias towards events beginning with the Hijra or the lead up to the Hijra from Mecca to Medina in 622, and then going forward to the end of Meccan period uh, when the prophet Muhammad dies in the year 11 or 632. Um, in general, you'll find that most of the earliest Mechazi material tends to focus predominantly on uh, the Medinan era. It seems that, that that featured much larger, both in the interest of the early traditionists and also in the historical memory of the early community. What we don't really have from these early letters is a chronological scheme. This is sort of added later. Uh, and the chronological scheme is constantly updated by each author. Uh, there's multiple examples of this. Uh, but eventually, I think what we have in the genre that emerges mostly among the, the scholars of Medina is an attempt to provide an orderly chronological dated account of the life of Muhammad around these specific themes, these kind of thematic battles in particular, and also these set pieces that one finds in the Sira. And I think this largely this broad outline uh, with exceptions is, is probably historical, um, although not in all the details in its general broad outlines. But there are, are problems, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of a problem, things that I do not think is part of historical uh, with how the, the early tradition works. Uh, for one, one of the things that's interesting that you'll find is that the early tradition, the early Meghazi literature is absolutely not in agreement about uh, when the prophet Muhammad was born. 
Um, Ibn Ishaq very famously puts it in the year of the elephant. Almost no early Medinan does. Azuhri puts the year of the elephant many, many years prior to the birth of Muhammad. Uh, the same thing goes for Musa ibn Uqba. Uh, in general, how chronology worked was more or less guesswork, with the exception, I believe, of the date of the Hijra. And so a lot of the things that are used as a substitute for um, actual knowledge of the age are a series of in inferences that sometimes can be somewhat problematic. So uh, the example I think that's interesting that I would give is the idea that the Prophet Muhammad was 40 years of age when he received his first revelation. I don't think we really know how old the Prophet Muhammad was. Maybe he didn't know himself. I don't know. There's no way for me to know that. But I'll give you a sense of how I understand uh, his age as, as having been determined. Um, in essence, if we look at uh, the age of 40, as it's portrayed in the Quran, and as it's portrayed in the general context of late antiquity, it's an ideal age. We already see this in Surah Al-Ahqaf in uh, the 15th verse, where it says, we have commanded man to be good to his parents. His mother struggled to carry him and struggled to give birth to him. His bearing and weaning took a full 30 months. When he has grown to manhood and reached of the age of 40, he may say, Lord, help me to be truly grateful for your favors uh, to me and my to my parents and help me to do good works. You, you, uh, <clears throat> to do work that pleases you, sorry. Make my offspring good. I turn to you, I am one of those who devote themselves to you. That is, I am among al Muslimin. Uh, so this key thing is, uh, when a man grows and reaches the age of 40, why the age of 40? Why is that an important age? Well, in general, uh, in the ancient and late antique world, uh, the age of 40 was considered to be the acme of a person's life. It is the culmination of their age. Um, so you're still a young and you're still a young kid, I guess, until you're 30. So those of you who are uh, under 30, congratulations, you're still a child. Um, not a child, but you're still, still very young. Uh, when you reach 30 and 50, that's when you're in your prime. Um, and 40 in particular is when you're supposed to be in your prime. Uh, old age begins when you're 50. For those of you who are over 50, I'm sorry, I'll join you soon. It's the way of life. You're lucky if you get to live that long, right? Uh, in any case, how did, with this idea of the Prophet Muhammad being 40, uh, when he receives revelation, the idea was that he is at the acme of his, or the kind of the, the culmination of his life, at his age, and the full powers of his personhood. Um, and partly, this is also based upon another verse in the Quran uh, from the 10th Surah, Yunus, the 16th verse, where the divine uh, uh, a voice commands him uh, to say as following, had God so willed, I should say God, not Gad, sorry about that. Had God so willed, I would neither have recited the revelation to you, that is to you, Quraysh, or apprised you of it. I had remained among you for an omer before that. Do you not understand? This idea that the prophet was uh, among Quraysh for the span of an omer is very key to assigning him the age 40 uh, in the Mahazi literature. So it's an exegetical theme, right? So an Umar is to be 40 years. It's like kind of the basic lifespan, okay? So these are some of the things we call like the exegetical nature uh, or some of the tendentious nature of the Mahazi of literature. In general, the way that scholarship has dealt with this is a very old model uh, that was first proposed by a scholar who was very learned and very erudite, but had a very jaundiced and unfortunately uh, nasty view of Islam and its early personalities, uh, uh, a man by the name of Henri Lamont. And uh, he was very strongly criticized by, I think, uh, Becker, I should have, um, but I think one, one of the more interesting thinkers of early kind of Germanophone scholarship in the oral religious tradition called Heinrich Becker. Um, and he's the one that put up kind of the schema summarizing Lamont's view. And the way that they, they saw all these materials going together and feeding into the Sira Mahazi was that you have sort of its sources, 
And how the Mahazi literature works is that you have the Quran and its interpretation, and you have the historical memory of the early community, and that feeds also into exegesis, and it feeds also into the tradition, the Hadith. And then you have legends and religious questions. These are questions related to law, religious practice and stuff. And these go both in these categories, tafsir, hadith. And then these all feed into the Mahazi uh, Sira literature. Um, and the task of the historian, as Lamont saw it, was to read the Mahazi Sira literature and to perceive when hadith are at play when tafsir are at play, and put aside the parts that are trying to explain the Quran or trying to explain or introduce legends and religious questions and sort of get to this part, historical memory, the historical kernel, right? A magical historical kernel that all of us PhDs in history get when we finish our degree. Anyway. Um, this is this is the wrong model, but I think this is still the model that a lot of uh, of us still have. That when we write uh, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, we got to rely upon the Mahazi Sira literature, and we just got to be very careful with how we read it. We're going to use our historian's nose. We're going to use our kind of ability to perceive things with our just kind of gut educated guess to separate the wheat from the chaff. So to separate legend. From historical reality. Uh, I think this model is wrong. I think we can we can skip <laughs> all this. Number one, I think we can use the Quran alone, alone to do a lot. Uh, I think the Maghazi Sira literature uh, actually evolved simultaneously with Tafsir and Hadith, not um, out of them in any way. And I think that a lot of these legends and religious questions have a lot to tell us about uh, the historical Muhammad, actually, um, in many ways, from an anthropological perspective, it tells us what sort of beliefs, what sort of customs, what sort of cultic practices were popular in the generations immediately following, and how they debated them, and how they settled them as well. So I think we, we're ripe for a new model. It's not there yet. I haven't posted my alternative model, um, because I haven't yet settled on how I want that to look. But in general, what my book suggests is that I think that we can uh, get what I call a low resolution view of who the Prophet Muhammad was. And we can do that, uh, one, by using the earliest sources that are available to us uh, from the seventh century. These are non-Muslim sources in some sense, like they're Armenian sources, they're Greek sources, they're Syriac sources, uh, but they're also Arabic sources that survive in the form of papyri and inscriptions and uh, also uh, the Quran itself, of course. Um, and we also have the benefit of what we're discovering about uh, the Arabian context as well, thanks to archeology span and also kind of renewed historiographical uh, interest. So that's how I would like to see the, the three pillars of, of um, of our low resolution view of the Prophet Muhammad being constructed. That is from the Quran, uh, from the archeological and material record, and then also from our seventh century sources. Uh, but I also think that the Mahazi Sir literature will have an important role to play in terms of understanding uh, the larger uh, historical context and, um, and the series of historical events that, that comprise much of the Prophet Muhammad's life and those of his early followers. And I think that the, the literature still has uh, a lot of surprises in store for us, even if I do not think it is straightforward history, to use Cronin's term, I think it will be a promising source to help us go from a low resolution view of the Prophet Muhammad's life and his preaching to a higher resolution view where we know uh, more details than otherwise we would without the benefit of, um, of that source. In any case, there's more we could talk about, but I think I'm, I've gone a bit long. It's about 50 minutes, I think I've gone. Um, so I'm going to stop there and open the floor questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor so much, Anthony. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why we love 
listening to you is because unlike some other scholars, you have the ability to really communicate to the public. So thank you so much for that engaging discussion. And if anyone has questions, please do ask them in the chat. We'll obviously prioritize uh, students in the summer school. Um, so we're still waiting on kind of questions right now. Um, <clears throat> but just to sum, you know, I'll start it off uh, with the question. So it seems like you're taking Professor Anthony kind of a, a middle path, a via media. Uh, and this is probably due to your Islamic reasons of wanting to tread the metal, middle path, right? No, I'm just kidding. But um, so kind of between two extremes, kind of we started with this kind of what can be called, quote, traditionalist approach of Montgomery Watt, who mm -hmm. just kind of spliced away the miraculous aspects and then presented the Sira. And then kind of what can be called maybe the revisionist or extreme revisionist approach of initially Krona and Cook and Wandsboro in the 1970s. And now we're kind of going to this middle approach, which I think is encapsulated in your book, if if uh, if I've characterized that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this is the current state, like the dominant view in Isla uh, Islamic studies scholarship, Quranic studies? Um, that was kind of my impression up until very recently when I realized, <clears throat> well, Professor Shoemaker has made an intervention. And then I recently got this volume the study of islamic origins and then i'm kind of scratching my head and saying hmm, maybe it's not the dominant view i'm not really sure mm -hmm. so can you kind of give us what you, your take is on the current state of affairs within the field um mm -hmm. do you think your view is the mainstream or how would you kind of class or is it still mm -hmm. up in the air i mean i think it's still up in the air i so i think what is i would I will accept the, the middle of the road label i don't want but i would never label myself but i would rather say it's up optimistic um and in general i think that one of the unintended consequences of skepticism the, the more radical skepticism and the more radical revisionist theories that have been put forward is that in general they have been received maybe enthusiastically by their own crowd by sympathizers but in general they have not been broadly received with sympathy. And what it led has led to, I think, and this is mostly from Bahnam Sadavi and Muslim Gardarzi's famous article. What it led to, I think, is uh, in general, historians of the Islamic world or late antiquity saying, like, I'm just not going to touch this because the evidence is poor for the traditional view, and the evidence is poor for the revisionist view. And I'm just not interested. And it seems like our source material is, is so low quality and so little survives. There's any research question that you have really is not going to be answerable anyway. So you're, you're more or less wasting your time. And this can be even seen in non religion scholars like uh, Joseph Van Es on his like, famous magisterial Telewigen Gesellschaft, his theology and society. Where does he begin? He begins the second century Hijri. Then he goes to the third century. What happened to the first century? He didn't think anything was really knowable. I mean, that was his, he tacitly assumed that the seventh century was off limits in terms of knowability, what we could say about Islam or Islamic theology. Part of that was related to a subject matter. I mean, theology takes a while to gain traction in, in any tradition. Um, but really what I, I'm more interested in doing is, is in trying to um, have people think, oh, I can create a research project. I can have a research question. And there's so much material. There's actually a richness of material that very creative, surprising things can be done. It's not a kind of a graveyard of historiography. It's sort of really a rich orchard. And there's a lot of fruit for the picking. Um, if you go through the sources, you master them and you, and you treat them carefully. Um, but I, th I think in terms of whether or not that will be a long-term trend, depends on, you know, things that are way beyond my control. You know, like what do grad students choose for their PhD topics? And then if grad students do choose something that is related to early Islam as their PhD topics, do they get jobs? You know, are people trained uh, in these questions at like the PhD factories and things like that? And you know, this, those, are, those are big kind of questions. And I think historically, uh, the study of early Islam has gone in fits and starts you know, like generation boom, and then a gap, generation boom, and then a gap. Right now we're in a boom, a chronic study boom. Um, 
but you know, is, is that going to be sustained? I wouldn't understand. It's... Uh, thank you so much. So to follow up on that, so basically, you're kind. Of, if correct me if I'm wrong, but are you kind of rejecting that kind of statement uh, attributed to Krona? I think uh, that you can either, when it comes to the traditional sources, you can either accept it or you can reject it, but you cannot work with it. I think that's paraphrase the quote. And uh, interestingly yeah. enough, I've seen it cited by. I think Jonathan Brown uh, on the flip yeah. side, taking a more yeah. traditionalist approach. So are yeah. you kind of pushing back against that and saying, no, we can engage with the sources, but that's yeah. still very much in the infancy, I guess, correct? Yeah, I, I think we can engage a lot with the sources. I, I think we can work with them incredibly. Like, So I'll give you an example that's a simple example uh, that overlaps a bit with the serial literature. So... Um, one of the most amazing documents that we have uh, from the early Islamic period is uh, Ibn al-Khaledi's compendium of all the genealogies of the Arab tribes, okay? So the names, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it's 35,000 names of people. Um, this is, prop, I would, so the one of the things that this group will raise is, like, okay, this is just a bunch of names, the genealogy. But this is supposed to be a record of a people this naturally raises questions. Well, what kind of cultural historical context would give rise to a desire to create something like this? And why would this knowledge of the map of the Arabian tribes uh, be written down? And, and secondly, what can we learn from it? This is a huge onomasticon of 35,000. So is there, there's nothing with, like parallel with that. Like we don't have the same thing for the Germanic tribes. You know, we don't have the same thing for like the Visigoths and things like that. We don't they have a, an onomasticon of that scale. It's like, it's almost unheard of. Um, and so there's a lot you can do with this sort of material. And that's just one example. And um, Merazi has similar lists like that as well. Uh, the participants in the Battle of Badr and Ahad and things like that. So why were these important and why did they survive? Um, you know, a lot of times I remember like, trying to read the Bible for the first time, like joke is you get to a book like Chronicles or something, has all these genealogies, like, oh God, this is boring. Why would anyone ever bother to write this down? And later on, as you get older and you get a sense of time pass, like you were like, this is a record for the future and this needs to be preserved. It contains a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, of wisdom and value for later generations. And, and for the very early Muslims, having a record of your tribe, your genealogy one and two, whether or not your genealogy included people that fought in the earliest battles of the prophet determines something very important, your salary, your sal how much uh, you would receive from the state in terms of Atta as a member, uh, a conscripted member, of a male participant in the, in the army. And so this, this had major kind of administrative uh, consequences uh, and taxation consequences for the people that were doing other farming and things like that too. So. Uh, great. So I'll ask some questions from the audience now. So the first question, actually, the, these two questions are tied together. So I'll just ask them together. So the question goes, the first one goes, what are the main proofs for what you claim that the Quran was composed only about 20 years after the prophet's death? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's very much, and I think this is on people's minds nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. because the second question is very much related to this. And that question goes, um, so many thanks to Sean for an amazing talk. I also want to thank, okay, uh, the moderator. Okay. So my question, would you please express your opinion on the new claim, mostly proposed by uh, Professor Stephen Shoemaker, who questioned the authentic authenticity of carbon dating of the Quran due to uh, different calibration curves between Europe mm -hmm. and the Middle East. So that's a little bit very specific, but I guess it's mm -hmm. basically how can, are we quite certain about our claims that the Quran is early? And what do you say to the push recent pushback against mm -hmm. that claim? Because I think that would, uh, you know, unmoor everything if that was the mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Um, so one thing I'll say is that uh, Stephen Schumacher and I are very close friends and we talk about this a lot, a very passionate way, and uh, we do not agree whatsoever. I mean, uh, Stephen was was very helpful when I had my first professorship uh, at Oregon, and I've worked with him on projects. And I've heard massive amounts from him about late in ancient Christianity, but I adamantly disagree with him on just about everything related to. Um, in any case, with that being said, why do I personally believe that? 
650 is a good day, all right? Um, and so that would be automatic compilation. Um, and this doesn't mean that I, for example, affirm every single um, iota and every single detail of the account of Azuhri, who is the main version of the account uh, of the automatic compilation and things like that. But why do I affirm the date? So I think there are three regimes of, of evidence that need to be grappled with and they are complementary and they converge number one well you can even say four but i'm going to say just three and we'll leave aside the tradition uh number one um we have paleography okay so if you look at the evolution of the arabic script and how it um, changes over time and how it becomes formalized and really how it becomes an a regularized imperial script, very angular, regular. You can, uh, you know, when people write, they show signs of training and things like this. This definitely occurs by the time that we get to the 690s, the reign of Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan. Uh, and you can see it, for example, the emergence of Kufic on the, uh, um, the inscriptions of the Dome of the Rock, of which we had many, some on copper, some in mosaic. Um, and, if you look at our earliest copies of the Quran, we have some that are in that regularized imperial script that's developed by the Umayyads uh, and probably at their instigation. But we also have an earlier uh, version of the script that we call Hijazi. It leans, it's irregular. It does not show a signs of systematic training and regularization. And so it precedes the development of an imperial scriptorium, okay? So that's one evidence. A piece of that. So I think if we have a very securely datable uh, emergence of a regular script under Abd al Malik, and we have an earlier version, that's a nice paleographic argument. Okay. Um, number two would be the codicological evidence. And so, how codicology works? It's it's a, a pretty simple process, but it deals with a lot of nitty gritty details. But what you can do is every copy of just about anything that's not printed uh, differs and has tiny variations. These can be variations in spelling, or they can be variations in words, um, or they can be variations in like the order and arrangement of the book and things like that. And in essence, when you look at all, any sort of book, um, you can find what scholars call a text type. So a template that served as the copy for a bunch of different other copies. And if you look at later copies, you can determine that this copy was written on a different uh, template in the other. I'll give you a very simple example. American English and British English differ in how they um, um, <laughs> they differ in how they spell like silly words like color. C O L O R or C O L O U R. So if you have two copies of a book, one's printed in American English, one's written in uh, UK English, you can basically have an idea of where they come from. Sometimes this goes into bigger things like uh, J.K. Rowling, when she published her uh, her first book in the Harry Potter series, the title of it was Harry Potter and the Blank Stone. Which one do you know? Do you know the Philosopher's Stone or do you know the Sorcerer's Stone? So basically, if you know the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, that's the UK version. I think I'm getting this right. The Sorcerer's Stone is the American version because I guess they thought Americans were too illiterate to know that philosopher meant a sorcerer rather than Aristotle. But in any case, you can kind of tell where which which region a copy comes from based upon these sorts of little details. So when we do the same thing with the Quran, um, we have more or less a codicological uh, evidence that we have an original copy that was kind of put out to these different versions that match, I think, the 650 date really well. And the third one, I'll, I'll add the radiocarbon dating to that. Radiocarbon dating uh, does have a problem with uh, being extremely precise, like you're never going to find a... Uh, and so when you have a, a dating range, uh, that range has a high probability, but any specific date within that range has a very low probability. And so if you look at the early date ranges that we have for, say, for example, the Sanat Palimpsest, um, it's very compelling when combined with those other three versions, uh, those other sorts of evidence 
um, that we're dealing with something that comes from the middle of the seventh century rather than something that's in, for like say from the late seventh century or the early eighth century. Um, in, in general, I'll, I'll add is that as far as we know, all of that early material has, um, you know, it, it's very regular. So it comes from a singular text type. There are differences, but they're, they come from a singular text type. Sura order, it's all the same across the board. And the one real prominent example is that palimpsest where the suras are not in the same order and does not represent the same text type, but it's still fundamentally the Quran as we know it. Uh, no, no kind of variance that we would find in there that would radically upend our understanding of what the Quran says or what the Quran contains and, and things like that. Well, thank you so much. And I, and I guess would we also include the lack of historical anachronisms compared to maybe the Hadith corpus, I think? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a good one. Um, there are, yeah, in general, there are little verses that people like to point out to as potential historical anachronisms. Um, but in general, I, I think they're mostly a nothing burger. Um, but some, you know, this is the thing. Um, most historians uh, play with this idea of plausibility and it's a very slippery concept. I mean, can you provide a definition of plausibility that everybody's going to agree on or a standard of plausibility? Everything's like, no, probably not. Um, and so what I personally consider to be plausible, uh, I try not to be subjective about it. But uh, in general, I feel that uh, I have a general rule of thumb that I repeat like ad nauseum to my students. I, I basically say you're on good grounds as long as you're arguing with the evidence. Uh, but you're on, you're not on good grounds if you're arguing against the evidence. And so in general, if you are trying to minimize the significance of evidence rather than to integrate that evidence into your account for what you think happened in the past, then uh, maybe you should reevaluate. I think that that tends to be, in my experience, um, you know, a, a methodological flaw of a lot of the more skeptical accounts. They have constant need to have recourse to uh, arguing against evidence, not just with evidence. Well, I think that, that perfectly, be. thank you. That perfectly teases up for the next question, which is as follows. So the person writes, in the introduction of your book, you stated that we should read Sira literature in light of the Quran. Uh, mm -hmm. Does this superiority of the Quran extend over other early sorts of documents? For example, some of the outsider witnesses depict early Islam as a messianic movement, but one can... Um, difficultly, I guess, read the Quran as the, I guess it's, they want to say the manifestation of a messianic movement. How should we deal? Well, I guess they're saying it's difficult to see the Quran um, in this way uh, or read it in this way. How should we deal mm. with such conflicts? And I actually mm. wanted to contextualize this question a little bit more as well, because when I was listening to your talk, you said that you had um, kind of three poles or three pillars. Uh, one is the Quran. And then two is the non-Muslim early sources. And then I also had a question of what, what exactly you meant by the early Muslim sources. Um, and and my, my question is, I listened to another one of your talks in which you were talking about the question of intercession. And mm -hmm. the early material evidence indicates that intercession of the prophet on the day of judgment, I'm assuming, was a very early idea. And yet it's mm. absent from the Quran. And in my view, and I think uh, it, it was reflected, Professor Sinai also expressed this, that it seems to run against the Quran. Um, and the, the intersect, the accept clauses or the mitigating clauses to me, as mm. I read it, uh, I agree with Professor Sinai that it's talking about the angels who are kind of, uh, uh, you know, being these automatons just carrying out God's wishes. So even mm. though we have early material evidence that speaks to this, it runs against the Quran. So how useful is that evidence uh, and then also with the non-Muslim sources, um, is it really that early? It seems to be after the conquest. So mm -hmm. how do we how do we actually use that? So is it really anything mm -hmm. other than the Quran that we're using is my question? And how do we use mm -hmm. it then? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, um, uh, Mr. Jawad and Professor Anthony. Can you please uh, speak a little bit slower? Our translator is... Uh, <laughs> exhausted yes and any <laughs> messages I, to please slow down <laughs> i speak at 2x speed at normal normal yes. so i'll try to slow it down thank you very much okay. um okay yeah i can answer that so 
what do we know about the Prophet Muhammad from non-Muslim sources? What do we know about Islam from the non-Muslim sources? Not a lot. <laughs> it, it's the the it, the non-Muslim sources say very little, and often I think what they say is somewhat distorted. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if you look at Sabios, he gives a list of the the Arabian tribes. He lists them as twelve. And he gives their names. And none of those names align anything with what we know from the Arabic tradition at all. Uh, where do they come from? So where they come from is the Bible. Uh, Genesis speaks of Ishmael becoming a great nation, just like Israel. And also Genesis talks about the 12 princes that will emerge from Ishmael. And this becomes a common theme in uh, Christian literature in general, is that when they looked at the world, the inhabited world as they knew it, they tried to assimilate the ethnography of the Roman Empire and beyond into the ethnography of the Bible, especially as found in Genesis chapter 10, um, with the table of nations and also the dispersal of nations at the uh, after the Tower of Babel. And so he's reading the early uh, Islamic conquest through his own filter, through his biblical kind of Christian filter. Okay? And that's a, a genuine problem that we run with all of the early Christian sources. Uh, however, at the same time, with that being said, what he does know is pretty extraordinary. Um, and he names his sources as well. Like he's uh, when he reports what he has heard, he says that he it is, he's not sitting in Armenia, you know, writing it by guesswork. He says, I heard this material from someone that was taken captive from Pal in Palestine and they escaped. Right. So there are real kind of knowledge networks that are going on. Um, so there it's rare that we find material that is totally. Like wrong and against the Quran, and at least what the Quranic claims are that I can think of. Um, probably what the questioner has in mind is uh, the teachings of Jacob or the doctrine of, of Jacob, the recently baptized, where uh, the Prophet Muhammad is uh, preaching the coming of the Messiah. Um, that's, I mean, it's a larger question of whether, how early did Muslims affirm the second coming of Jesus? And is that in the Quran? Um, I think it might be alluded to in the Quran, uh, but I think it's also extremely early belief among Muslims as well that Jesus would come back um, and defeat the Antichrist. Um, there's a, it, it appears on the earliest records that we have of the Hadith, uh, the earliest records that we have of the uh, tradition, the Fada al Quds literature, the merits of Jerusalem literature. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think it's there at the earliest layer. And to your question about intercession, I think that uh, the Quran is somewhat ambiguous about intercession. Uh, it has a lot of those weird, uh, not weird, it has a, a lot of those unnecessary escape clauses like except by his permission what does that mean i don't know what that means um what i do know is that very early on the prophet muhammad assumed a very important role as an intercessor in in the hadith literature i think i know why this is the case um i think it if you look at the hadith literature that portrays the Prophet Muhammad as an intercessor. It's very similar to the stories that are told about the Apostle Paul and the Apocalypse of Paul, very similar to the stories told about uh, the Virgin Mary and many of the Dornitian narratives, that is the narratives about how she died in, in her role. It makes sense in the context in which um, there are already many churches, many walls, and many stones that bore 
inscriptions in Greek that prayed for the intercession of saints, martyrs, the Virgin herself, and other holy figures. Um, and this is a long-standing debate within Islamic intellectual history. I don't need to tell anyone that. Um, can the righteous dead pray with us? And can we ask the righteous dead to help us pray? That's that's a big question. But what's really striking uh, about uh, the Prophet Muhammad's intercession in particular is that it happens at the end of time. So it's one thing to say, brother, sister, will you pray with me? It's another thing to say that the Prophet Muhammad will change the judgment of God because of his requests. Those are two radical, different, radically different claims. So if in your view, that is from the earliest layer, um, this idea of the second coming, uh, how does how do we reconcile that with the idea? And do you agree with the idea that the prophet Muhammad was, and I always mix up these two words, I can never remember them, but mm -hmm. an apocalyptic or eschatological uh, mm -hmm. prophet in the sense that, in at least in my reading, the Quran seems to imply the impending end is, it's it's now. Um, yeah. So do you think that's a more like how in, in when it comes to the historical Jesus, many scholars think that Jesus, the historical Jesus was saying that the son of man is imminently coming in their lifetime. So would you would you take it in that direction? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the direction that we see recorded in its reception history. Right. So the early Meccan Soras are very clear that a, a cataclysm is going to happen to the Meccans if they don't repent, right? And the question is, is the cataclysm local? Is it world historical? Um, I haven't really made up my mind on that, to be honest. Um, I, I definitely see that there is a focus on the Day of Judgment as this eschatological combination of the moral arc of history. Right, that history has this direction that it's going, uh, and that the Quran says it will culminate basically with everything, all scores will be settled, right? All human beings will be held accountable for their good deeds and, and their bad deeds for sure. Um, but will there be like a full on apocalypse, a full on end of history soon? I, you know, I'm unsure. Yeah, I, I still am unsure. I, but I definitely think that that belief, um, if it's not unambiguous in the Quran, I think it's unambiguous um, in our in our next layer of early um, attestations to the religiosity of of Muslims. Uh, great, thank you. So I'm going to ask some more questions, if that's okay. Um, so this is from the audience who said, and this is just following up on the carbon dating. So there are a lot of questions on that issue. Um, so uh, it's, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, don't you think the dating of the Quran based on paleography itself is dependent on a sort of car carbon dating? No, uh, there's a couple of reasons. No, so, um, one of the thing is, so we don't have any Quran manuscript that is, uh, dated that has a, a colophon that has a note it says i copied or i finished copying this quran and this date that is in, in the time period that we're talking about so seventh century um but we do have a lot of other things that are written in arabic that are very early uh i mean they give you an idea i mean we have papyri that are dated to the hijri era that are from like from the uh the caliphate of omar ibn Khattab. We have papyri that have the clay seal of Amr ibn al As on it. All right. So that's a literally a, a it's a seal of an ox. Okay. And so we have a pretty good idea of how the Arabic script evolved, right? Uh, we know how, we have it a good documentation at just about every stage. Um, and this even applies to uh, what we call a lapidary script. So the script that is written on stones, okay, not just on papyri. So it's true that paleography cannot tell you that in 657, that everyone changed how 
they were writing. But there, I do think it, uh, it is visible with generations. I'll give an anecdote. Maybe it'll convince you, maybe it won't. But I used to get bad grades. In, we used to get grades in handwriting in my grade school. And I always used to get like Fs <laughs> because my handwriting was supposedly sloppy. And I felt like my teacher would pick on me, right? So like we would do spelling tests and I'd write the tests and uh, the two grades like, I can't read this. Of course she could read it. She wouldn't give me the benefit of the doubt. She'd mark it wrong, all right? And things like this. So I hated it. And so my grandfather heard this and he was extremely upset with me. And he said, the Anthony family, he was very keen on the Anthony, this, Anthony, that. The Anthony family has good handwriting. All right? This is our family honor, so state. And my grandfather, went to his bedroom somewhere, his office, I can't remember. And he pulls out sheets of paper. It was his homework from grade school. Why he had his handwriting homework from grade school and a file somewhere, I don't know, but he had it. And he showed me how he was taught to write his penmanship. And one of the things he said I did wrong was I wrote with my fingers. So when I would write, I would use my fingers. Like, you should use your elbow. Your fingers should never move. And he would make me do circles across a line, like constantly, things like that, uh, until my handwriting improved, okay? So why am I telling this story? If you look at my grandfather's handwriting, if you look at my father's handwriting, and if you look at my handwriting, and then especially if you look at my son's handwriting, they're very different. The generational shift is very easy to see. So my son, for example, never they're very different because we're people or individuals but i mean i'm talking about even style so my son for example was never taught cursive it galls me he has no signature when he writes his name julius i love you i'm sorry you write your name he looks like he he is 15 years old looks like you know like he like he's in elementary school or something. and i always tease him i said man you have to learn how to read cursive i'm not and how to write cursive um, but for some reason, uh, you know, his school district decided not to teach cursive. So the same thing, uh, when you, you, how you write your letters is a byproduct of your educational formation. And we can see the difference between generations, I believe. Um, and if inscriptions and anything like that skew in any direction, they skew to be conservative. So when you see innovation in an inscription, uh, then this is already, it's an indication that it's already older and what that inscription is oftentimes, not always, but often. Anyway, I hope uh, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that made a lot of sense and is very interesting. I would say that maybe this next generation writes, you wrote with your fingers, they write with their toes, it seems like the, the, <laughs> yeah, the writing is, uh, yeah, it's just getting worse and worse. But I, I would yeah. say that probably, Everyone in Iran, if it's like Pakistan, would probably call, consider all of our writing to be horrendous. Because when I lived in Pakistan, I mean, some people, they had such beautiful penmanship. It was just out of yeah. this world. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I had good handwriting, um, but I think <laughs> I heard them. Uh, but I'm yeah. always commenting on because they said, as a physician, you write really well. And I said, well, probably that's why <laughs> I was meant to be a physician. Um, yeah. But OK, great. Um, so uh, another question, if you don't mind, and you can tell us, so I think we're due to go to 945 or here for you, it's the, I think, 1245. Um, so, okay. So the next question is, uh, you claim that the Quran itself could be considered as an authentic source for the history of Muhammad's life and times. What is your proposed method for using this text, which does not provide a historical narrative as a historical source? And then there are other questions that we're asking, for example, how do we know that it's Muhammad that's referring referred to in the text. Maybe it's a different Muhammad. That was a question that was asked. And actually on that, I have a follow-up question, which is, I mean, how do we know that even the historical figure's name is Muhammad? Maybe that's an honorary, honorific, and not his original name. Um, so that's, that's the question. I, I think uh, related to this is, I mean, so you, you, you've basically working out a way to get history from these sources, from this source, uh, but in your presentation, actually, mostly you're just proving the existence of a person. And mm -hmm. that seems very minimal. I, it reminds me of something, so Suleiman Dost, um, 
uh, was a professor now, he was telling me that after he finished his dissertation, he told his parents and I think in Turkey, and they live in a rural part of Turkey, he, he told them like what he had spent the last decade doing, which was proving that the Quran uh, comes from the Hijazi <laughs> region. And his parents, <laughs> his parents who are like, you know, they like live in a rural part of Turkey. They're like, that's what you spent all this time in a university in America learning. We, we, we knew that from a long time ago, which is kind of funny. But um, yeah, so my question, I guess, related to that is how do we actually use these sources to get more than just like you're saying this low def version of the prophet's life story. What does that really entail? So we're talking about a skeletal survey. And how do we escape the issue of circularity? Because I feel, and I think this is well recognized in biblical studies and the historical Jesus, that almost all of us can fall into circularity or do fall into circularities. How do we escape that? Does that make any sense? Did I ask a... Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Um, one example is I think that, okay, there's a couple of things. There's a lot of things to be said about that. Um, okay, so I think about where to start. So. First and foremost, I would question the presupposition, which is very common in the literature, that no historical events are discussed in the Quran whatsoever. I think that's totally wrong. Um, I think that most of the thematic battles that we see occurring in this in the Seer literature, not all, are pretty explicitly present in the Quran. Some of them are narrated as events. Uh, some of them are narrated to the detail that you even get the complaints of people, for example, after Ahad about the strategy that was adopted. Um, you have the name of Badr that's explicitly made. You have um, explicit references to both the uh, Hawazin and, and Ta'if and things like that. There's, there's a lot of actual historical research. There is a ton of detail about... Um, Interaction not just with the famous Zayd story, but also with wives in general in, in the Quran, in the medieval Quran. Uh, but the real centerpiece, I think, the real what I think the real fulcrum point of the Quran as a corpus, um, in my view, is is the Hijra, which I think is directly narrated in the Quran. Uh, even hiding with a, a companion is directly mentioned uh, very briefly in in the Quran. So. What eventually, what those of you that are like most skeptical towards me and maybe my approach will eventually be able to read, I hope one day, is, um, you know, I think that what you can do is you can build from the Hijra, which I think is a rock solid historical event, as kind of this inflection point of the Quran. And uh, you can, in ge general, working from the Hijra, before the Hijra and after Hijra, show a general trajectory of the life of the Prophet Muhammad and how his kind of mission unfolds. And we can determine who his audience is uh, in the in broad sweeps, who he's addressing, and so on and so forth. Like whether or not Muhammad is a title, well, that could be an epithet, I guess. That's that's theoretically possible. Um, the thing that gives me pause is that uh, it doesn't have an... So if, if you know anything about Arabic, you don't have like an alif lam. It's not al nabi al muhammad or al muhammad al nabi It's Muhammad al nabi So the fact that you don't have the in front of the name is significant. It could be a nickname that was given to him or something like that, but that was that's the name by which he was addressed. There's the old theory of, of Le Mans Sometimes you see Brian about that his original name was Qotham, and then subsequently he was called Muhammad and things like that. I think that if you consider the evidence for that to be strong, then you have a much more optimistic view of what the Arabic sources can tell us than, than I do. And when I've looked at that material, I don't find it to be very compelling. Um, but I mean, that's how I would briefly answer that. But I, I, just, I do not accept the idea that there are no events mentioned in the Quran whatsoever. So you mentioned Laman. Um, so one thing that he mentions, which really, I, I read it and I, so I agree with you, he had sort of this anti-Islamic bias, but there are a lot of gems in what he wrote as well. Yeah, he's, he's smart. And, he was... So one of the things that he said that, because I used to tell students that when I taught was that um, we can 
use the Quran as this kind of guide and see if they're exactly as you do. And I, and I do fall in your camp. Uh, I, I do find your book uh, very convincing. Um, but one thing that Laman mentions is that, so, so first we can look at stuff that, okay, our approach is we, we compare it to the Quran and say, okay, this diverges from the Quran. So maybe this is a later development. We mentioned intercession as a possibility or other things. But then what, what he mentions is that often the Sira material is exegetical. Uh, of course, Wandsboro mentioned the that mm -hmm. it's just exegesis. And so that leads mm -hmm. to that problem that we can't accept stuff that's going with the Quran either. In fact, he he's uh, indicating that we should take prioritize those reports that are not exegetical in nature. Mm -hmm. So in other words, are against the Quran or different than the Quran, which kind of leads us with nothing almost. But mm -hmm. I don't know how we can <laughs> resolve that. But yeah. um, if, no, okay, if you so have anything more to I... say on that, uh, but... Oh, sorry. We get more to say. No, no, please, please, please go ahead. Okay. So what I was going to say about about that approach, sometimes I think we forget that yes, the early Mahazis, the early scholars of the Mahazi literature were doing exegesis, but we do too. My book is exegesis. You know, it's it's an attempt to interpret the Quran. Um, and I think that their exegesis should stand or fall by its merits not because it's exegesis you know the act of interpretation is inescapable um and i think if your interpretation is cogent and to me it meets the criteria of making sense of the maximum amount of the data available uh and providing the best explanation of of the, the data then you're successful you know I mean, because just to play devil's advocate, they would claim that, okay, you say the hijras, well, who's to say it's from Mecca to Medina? I mean, it could be from some mm -hmm. other place. But I yeah. guess this is, so we all fall <laughs> well, back, I guess. So then I would say, place. they call the place that they do the hijra Medina, <laughs> they call it Adar, they call it Yahrab. It's explicitly named what it's called. And, and so the Quran mm -hmm. already has those names in there. And then also later on, so we talked about 48 surah, the place that they conquer at the end, is called Mecca. I mean, it's specifically named Mecca. It's also specifically called in that same surah, uh, the location of, um, you know, Al Bayt, right? It's, it's and also Al Masjid Al Haram. So that's all there. And so I think we need to be very careful reading this, the, the Quran itself, you know. Uh, in, in general, you could, one path, if I were to kind of argue against myself with, uh, is I would attack two things. Um, um, it wouldn't be pleasurable reading, but you could take maybe Richard Bell's approach where uh, the chapters of the Quran, the surahs of the Quran, uh, are not coherent as a literary unit. Yet rather, a surah is like a box into which many textual units were put together, hodgepodge, in an incoherent way. And so it's almost, an, you know, but the thing is, even Richard Bell believed that you could separate Meccan material and Medinian material out from one another. Um, the other approach would be to show that the Quran is incoherent as a corpus. So uh, let's take an example from outside Quranic studies, the Pauline epistles. So I think most scholars think that they have a, broad understanding of the chronological order in which Paul wrote his epistles. The Pauline epistles are somewhat similar to the Quran insofar as they're organized in the New Testament from longest to shortest, right? Like the surahs or the chapters of the Quran, right? So they're not organized in chronological order. So theoretically, uh, one could say that there are surahs that are not authentic. That are not a part of the original corpus of the messenger, like we do with a Pauline corpus. They say that, oh, Ephesians is not actually by um, Paul, or Timothy is not first Timothy, second Timothy, etc. They're not actually written by Paul. Theoretically, scholarship could go in that direction. Um, but so far, no one has really done that in a compelling way. Uh, and to me as well, um, 
usually the evolution in thought tends to go the opposite of what you find in thought. So I'll give you an example. So our earliest forms of the Quran's message seems to be in the short surahs. And the later developed ideas happen in the long surahs. This is kind of the opposite with the Pauline corpus, where uh, the earliest ideas tend to be in the longer ones, like Romans, Corinthians, and things like that. And the later developments or the changes in vocabulary and stuff tends to happen in the shorter uh, uh, epistles, like, you know, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, those are not authentic, right? Um, so, yeah, just some thoughts. And can I ask you on that? So you mentioned the Pauline corpus. So one question I have for you is, if we say that we're studying the Quran, so there is a trend, a very dominant trend in the academic space, like a post, very postmodernist when it comes to interpretation and hermeneutics, such that the text itself doesn't really say anything. It's just the communities of interpretation that bring mm -hmm. meaning to the text. Um, mm -hmm. And this kind of problematizes pretty much 90% of Quranic studies and biblical studies, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I mean, at least the dominant, mm -hmm. what we what we do. Um, but to push back against this, so I, I I think Professor Juan Cole, he talked about how we could treat the Quran as the Pauline corpus. Uh, now, of course, we have to then, like you said, think about is there anything that's pseudo-Pauline or not, but uh, that hasn't been proven yet. So do you think that we can look for coherence within the text? Because on the other side, you have, and I think Professor Shoemaker is there again, saying that we shouldn't be looking at this kind of coherence and this involves a lot of harmonization and can take a more religious aspect that we're assuming that the text is coherent um when we don't we shouldn't expect that mm -hmm. so for example yes. we want to look at the text and say what does it say again on intercession well you take all the verses that are on intercession and then you say okay can i make sense of this but maybe you can't make sense of it maybe part of it is incoherent so how, mm -hmm. how do we score how do you advise students when it comes to this yeah, uh, you know, it's a it's a difficult question uh, because whenever you proceed with any sort of analysis, you have to have a hypothesis that you begin with, right? So the question, as I pose, is if you begin with the hypothesis that the Quran is a coherent corpus, right? Um, one of the things that you should have in your mind, or at least in the back of your mind, is the question of what is the breaking point of this hypothesis, right? What are, these, these criteria can be quite arbitrary for people. Um, it's just the nature of how you develop a hypothesis or whatever. Um, and what that breaking point would be, I think it is, it's difficult to say. So uh, two examples, so one example that I know kind of quite well, um, and that I know is a favorite example of Shoemaker and also DMD and, and things. And so Surat Miriam is a credible kind of um, uh, surah uh, for many reasons, uh, but it has also this really famous um, depiction of the annunciation of the, uh, of the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary. And if you read that account of the Annunciation, um, in many ways, it is radically different from the account of the Annunciation that we find uh, later on. And I'm like, I'm totally blanking on which one it is. I'm confusing. It's in Al-Imran, of course. So it's very different. Um, no, no time to go through the details, but one of the basic things you could look at, for example, is uh, Mary receives an annunciation from a single uh, angel in Miriam and receives it from multiple angels in al Right. So why is that the case? Is, that, is it the case because uh, we have two different authors that reimagine the annunciation story in different ways? and different contexts, right? I think that Shoemaker and Dee would find that to be a very attractive thesis, right? Um, as a counter example to that thesis, one could take the story of Adam and the command, the divine command of the angels to bow to Adam. That story is retold 
more often than any other story in the Quran. It's told mostly in Meccan versions, but also in a Medinan version. All of those stories differ in some way, one from another. Um, and so what it seems like what's actually happening in that story is that a story is retold and repurposed for different instances. Not that we, I can't remember how many times the story appears, maybe five times. Um, but it's not that we have five different authors, but rather we have a single mind that is telling the story to an audience in five different ways. Um, and so in favor, you know, back to the Mary thing, in favor of my view that it's a coherent corpus, I would say that who, if, I would say that the account in Al Imran of the Annunciation seems to be dependent and in conversation with the account in Miriam. Um, so, yeah, like when would, what sort of evidence would convince me otherwise? It's something that I try to ask myself often enough, but I have not yet seen the evidence that will convince me otherwise. Thank you. And I think some, uh, my Muslim traditionalist friends would say, well, maybe the event happened five times, <laughs> which I think is <laughs> <Yeah>. unlikely. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a couple more questions from the students, if you don't mind. So this question, I'm not 100% sure if I understand it, but let's let's try it. So it says, uh, what is your approach to literacy versus orality in the time of the prophet and in the first decades of Islam? Do you think that the oral tradition dominates the written tradition in the beginnings for Quran and for Hadith? Hmm. I think it's a hybrid tradition. So that's that's my view. Um, literacy is always low, but not as low as I think some people think. Um, so this is one of the things that's kind of amazing, a little bit of a, a mystery. Um, is we know literacy was prevalent in Arabia. We know that literacy was pre prevalent for the Arabic language. And the reason why we know this is because of the early papyri that survive in Egypt and Masana and things like this. Uh, there was enough people that could staff governmental offices to write things like receipts and uh, requisition letters and all sorts of stuff like that uh, from the very beginning. Um, the tradition speaks of a group of people called Kutab al Wahi, the people that record the revelation. Um, and it has lists of them and things like that. Um, yeah, I th and literacy was present, and uh, people, I think, plied a trade as people that were known for writing and, and things like that. And I think in large part, um, the traditions were oral, they, inter they were oral and, um, and written. They interacted one with one another. I don't think there's a pure oral tradition or a pure uh, written tradition. I think there are ways that the so-called oral tradition is actually um, trying to interpret written things sometimes, but uh, uh, the way I often describe it is uh, is like musical notation. You know, like so we have music as it's performed, and also we have it as it is um, uh, written. It doesn't mean that you cannot perform music if you cannot read music. Uh, you'll have to learn it in another way. Uh, and there are many people that had massive amounts of scholarly knowledge and mastery, even without access to literacy. And we know this you know, simply because there were so many blind scholars, uh, both in early Islam and also uh, Judaism, Christianity, you know, basically any tradition has its major blind um, um, scholars. And of course, they could not read the written page, but they were far more erudite than either you or I. So. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, one more. Uh, can you, can one consider the epigraphies mentioning Abraha, Abraha and his attack uh, on the Arabian Peninsula and the time of Yemen's conquest by the Sasanian king to be among the sources used for determining Muhammad's date of birth? I think that there are sources for, so I think there are sources for determining uh, Abraha's reign uh, and his campaigns in Arabia, but not for the Prophet Muhammad's birth. The Prophet Muhammad, the idea of the Prophet Muhammad was born in the year of the elephant, I think is a pure fabrication of the eighth century. Um, it's, it, I, it, it causes a lot of consternation later on um, when, um, when, so if you look at a lot of the traditions of uh, Zuhri or Musa ibn Uqba and some others, and they put the year of the elephant 
so much earlier than than the uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad's birth. He had these later Hadith scholars are like, what is going on with this? Like, this is obviously to be rejected, and we know that you know it must be this date. And one of the ways that this date was settled upon, this is key to remember that it was that Ibn Ishaq's work was taught widely in Baghdad was by the use of astrological history. Okay, so one of the ways that you determined um, when events happen and when important events happen is through horoscopy, by drawing up historical horoscopes. This is a historiographical method and a, a method of decision making that has fallen out of favor unless you're an economist. If you're an economist, you're basically an astrologer of modern times, in my view. But in essence, this is how Baghdad was constructed or how they decided when to do so and how to do so. Uh, and astrologers had a big influence on early Islamic historiography. Uh, we even have a nice account of how Al-Kharazmi determined the horoscope of the Prophet Muhammad and, and how he kind of tweaked the date to make it work with the stars alignments and things like this. This is kind of common specialist knowledge, but not so much appreciated on the outside. And I think our friend Henry Lama has an article on this called The Age of Muhammad and the Chronology of the Sira, in which he talks about specifically about exactly what you're talking about. How yeah. the it was constructed later, and then he mentions the age of forty as well as as you did that this is why mm. the age of forty was was chosen or perhaps chosen. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that's it for as far as the questions from the audience. But I did, uh, if you have just a few more minutes, I had I just wanted to ask you about the research that you're doing now. Especially, I know that you're working on a translation, and this is quite exciting. The work that you're doing on the translation. Can you give us a little sneak peek of like what have you discovered in this uh, the work that you're uh, translating? Does that change anything that you've thought about about this era, and will it change the field at all? But what are your thoughts mm. on that? Because that's that's quite exciting. We can't wait. And when are we going to get our hands on the translation? <laughs> um, well, that's going to be it'll be a while. Um, so I'm because I'm doing I got a lot of pans in the fire. So not only am I doing that, that which I'll mention briefly, but I just got done working on a book with Stephen Shoemaker on the Persian conquest of Jerusalem in 614 and the earliest eyewitness account we have of that. Um, I am also putting the finishing touches on a translation and study in addition of Sirat Omar ibn Abdulaziz, so the earliest biography of Omar ibn Abdulaziz. And then I'm also working on this Meghazi of Musa. So the Meghazi of Musa ibn Uqba. It's very interesting. It's the only real Mehazi that doesn't reflect the patronage of a court per se, even though Musa bin Uqba, he was a, a maula, he was an underling or a client of the Zubarid family. Uh, so it does reflect some elite courtesy view and perhaps reflects the defunct um, uh, Zubarid court. But I think the most important large takeaway of Musa bin Uqba's Mehazi is that the Mahazi works coming out of Medina reflect, I think, a larger historiographical school that goes beyond any singular representative of that genre as an author. So beyond Mahabad al Ishaq, beyond Musa ibn Uqba, beyond Ibn Shahab al Zuhri, beyond Aura ibn al Zubair. I think this work shows it. Um, Musa ibn Uqba's book, I've read it now, um, at least the, the manuscript, only the, the Medinan part survives. And, uh, so the Meccan part doesn't survive, and then it ends in the middle of the Prophet Muhammad's uh, farewell sermon. Um, and so it has uh, more or less what you would expect. I don't think there's going to be lots of surprises if you know the literature. That, and I say if you know the literature, because a lot of people think they know the literature, but they've never really read it. And, I, and what I'm looking forward to is so people buy maybe Guillaume's translation of Ibn Ishaq and it sits on their desk and it's imposing, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, almost impossible to read through. Um, Musa ibn Uqba, you'll be able to sit down and you'll be able to read through it without dedicating months of your life to the task. And I think that will be an experience for most people that don't have access to the Arabic. Um, there are some things that, that I was suspicious of that I think it's confirmed. So um, Usually people think about the three Jewish tribes, the Madir, the Tainuqa, and the Qurayza. 
I've for a long time thought the Kainuqa were just totally made up. I think that I think the Musa text um, kind of confirms that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of interesting stuff there uh, that's uh, probably going to come to light. A lot of times when you're in the process of translating and and reading these texts very carefully, um, things really stick out. Begin to really stick out to you. Uh, another one that sticks out to me, I guess I could mention that might be general interest, is um, if you look at the early events of, in the Meccan period, some of are mentioned very briefly, and it seems to only been a, a long story later on. One of the most famous examples of these is the Isra. We have no real early extensive story of the Isra. All the, the very elaborate stories tend, tend to be um, much later. You know, like Musa just says, yeah, it happened, and then kind of moves on. He doesn't really say much about it. Um, Anyway, yeah, he has a really prominent role for Khadija, much more, it kind of expands her role in an interesting way. That might be because she's from the Banu Asad, so the Zubarid, Zubarid's clan, that might be some of the cases. Uh, hardly mentions Ali at all. Zubarids were very famously hostile to Ali, so it doesn't have a lot of mention at all. And I think that we're going to find it has kind of a Zubarid bias throughout it, but still, it's yet to be determined. Does, and this relates to uh, another question that was asked. Does this kind of reinforce your view? Like, how does it relate to your view towards uh, Sira Ibn Hisham? Like, does it uh, reinforce your view or, or mm-hmm. that it's reliable or th- does it change anything it does. for you? Um, no, not so much. So, I, I, what I would say is. Um, so there's this very famous book by Fuad Sitzkin. It's, uh, it's called Shish Vis Arabish and Shiftam. So, so it's the history of Arabic writings, not books. And in it, he goes through and he tries to identify all of the books that are lost, but are, that are preserved in later sources. Um, and many people were critical and skeptical of his approach because they said, well, if it's not extant, we can't be sure that it's ever existed. I think in, dec- in the decades after, whenever we have found an older book that's quoted by later sources, we have consistently found that those later sources quote it faithfully. They reproduce the text faithfully. And so when we have an earlier source being quoted by a later source, I think it's it's very safe to assume that yes, that's an accurate quotation, even if we lose the perspective of the global picture of the work. So when we have the actual work that survives, a lot of things are left out, right? Uh, things are rearranged, things are excerpted. And when you have the whole thing in front of you, that also changes your perspective on it. Well, thank you so much for all of your time, Professor Anthony. Is there any last final words you'd like to say? Or I just want to say thank you for everyone's patience in listening to me, Babylon, and for your interesting questions. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation as well. Uh, it's very generous of you. I, I hope uh, you had a good time and you profited from it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And I think now they're, they have a word to say as well in Persian. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Anthony. And thank you very much, Dr. Hashmi, for joining us tonight. Uh, here we are, we, are, we are night, but I think you are day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lunchtime. Thank you. For a really interesting uh, session. Uh, so we can wrap it up. Uh, man, uh, I, I'm going to say a few words in Persian. Dostan Aziz, خیلی متشکرم. ممنون از اینکه با ما همراه بودید. جلسه بسیار بسیار خوبی بود. امیدوارم که استفاده کرده باشید و خیلی ممنون. انشالله فردا روز آخر مدرسه است. در خدمتتون خواهیم بود. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can end this session and we hope that we have uh, the opportunity to have sessions like this in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.